First John chapter 5, verse 16. If any man see his brother sin a sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. There is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. A lot of substance here. Sometimes we read the word, we, we may not always know what it means. But the reference here is, if a man see his brother sin or sin. The reference here is specific to definite knowledge. Neither hearsay nor speculation is a substitute for actual first-hand knowledge. This is not a call to judgment or to gossip. This is a call to restoration. Now, in your own private time, you can examine the beginnings of Galatians chapter 6, in which it calls upon spiritual believers to restore fallen brothers rather than diminishing them. Because it could have been any of us who happened to fall. Don't ever believe that you're standing too tall to fall. And don't ever believe that just because somebody has fallen that God has abandoned them or that they were not who God called them to be to begin with. You see, you don't know when you're walking on solid ground, smoothly paved territory, you don't know what it costs to pave that territory for you. You don't know what it took to smooth it out so you don't have to worry about the ripples and the rocks and everything, but somebody that came along that same path, it, was, it had to be cleared, it had to be graded and leveled, it had to be made right for you. So to judge anyone who has gone before you, though they may fall, and though they may fall in a fantastical fashion, it is never our job to judge them. Because none of us are so innocent that we can judge anybody. And none of us can say for sure, if I would have been them, I wouldn't have done that. You have no idea the traps and the snares that Satan prepares for people who walk higher than the level where you are. Who have been called by God to do something different than what God has called for you to do. You just can't judge anybody else can't do it. You can't judge sinners. You can't judge saints. God did not save us to judge somebody. God saved us to bend over, help them get up. He'll deal with them. He'll deal with them. You see, I don't believe in punishing people anything that they may do. If they're in a position of visibility, I may pull them back so everybody's not constantly scrutinizing them. But I don't believe it's my job to punish anybody for anything that they see and that they may fall into because, but for the grace of God, I'm the one down there needing people to pull me up. I don't think it's for me to denigrate them with my tongue 
and talk about, oh, they should have done been this and they should have done that, blah, 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 blah. I want to be concerned about the issues collateral to it, that I understand the issues, that I, that I can pray correctly for the issues. I want to be careful. I use my tongue. I want to be careful how I use my tongue, and I want to be careful that the enemy don't use my mouth. Because you don't know what that person had to face. You don't know. And you don't know what God is going to do with the situation. Because some really bad situations have turned out to be <laughs> victorious, you know. And you don't want to curse that thing while God is about to bless it. Amen? No need for two to fall. This verse also reminds us, however, to be on the lookout for those who may have fallen. We're not prophesying their fall, but if you see someone that has fallen, you know, we should be looking out amongst our brothers and sisters to see who may be down. Because this represents an opportunity for us to demonstrate the love of God and to minister on his behalf. If any man see his brother, sin of sin, which is not unto death, he shall ask. He shall ask, and he shall give him life for them that sin not unto death. Boy, this is good right here. Because this opens up a whole new level of possibility for us as believers. Because it tells us we have the power to ask God to forgive somebody else for their sins. Jesus did it. Lord, forgive them. For they know not what they do. Even if we thought we knew what we were doing, most of the time we didn't know. Now, if we ask God to forgive someone else for their sin, we can't clean their record with God in the same way that their own personal confession would allow God to do. But what we do is we grant them life and another opportunity to confess their sin. You see, when people are downtrodden, when they've fallen a lot of times, they feel so guilty, so condemned, so separated from God that it's like death has occurred between them and God. We make up the head. We step in and say, God, let me link, let me, let me link, just like Jesus did for us. Let me link you in this person again. Let me step into the gap and make up the head. We're not beating anybody down. We're not telling them what all they're not. We're not trying to tell 25 other people what all they're not. That's not why God gave us a mouth. But when we're looking around for God, what can I do for you today? Maybe I can fast. No, brother, that's for you. Maybe I can pray. No, brother, that's for you. Maybe I can study my word. No, brother, that's for you. But well, maybe I can step in a gap between you and a fallen brother. <sighs> That's for me. You see, to waste such an opportunity by cursing the situation with our tongue, by having so much authority and judgment to say certain things, and now we can't even step into the gap because we've already cursed our opportunity to do so, we diminish any possibility that we have to do something for God. He say, you shall ask. You're going to give them life. Because they were dead. In their own mind, they were dead unto God. This advocacy through, through Christ Jesus is mercy on behalf of this brother or sister that could lead to grace. 
See, you can ask God, hey, grant them the mercy of being able to get back in connection with you. Father, do it for me. In the name of Jesus. The Apostle Paul did this for a brother, if you read the book of Philemon. He did this for a brother that had been in slavery and decided that he didn't want to be a slave anymore, and he just left. And Paul contacted his owner and said, Now, I know this man is your slave, and I am not trying to come in between now. I'm telling him to come back. I'm asking you to receive him with mercy. That both of you might receive the grace of God. You see, I didn't used to know this. And many times I put my mouth on situations. You know how we say, run in our mouths. I ain't the only one in the room, I'm sure. Probably three or four other people in here have done that before, Pastor Joe. Three or four other people have just leaped, boom, to a conclusion. And I know everything about the situation. I don't need any briefings or updates. I'm an expert. And we come to a place where we are just speaking with the authority of a God when we really don't have what it takes. You see, except God actually appoints and anoints you to be in such a position, you can't do it. And believe me when I tell you, as one whom God has appointed and anointed to be in such situations, I never do it with joy. I never hurt somebody's heart or whatever that kind of joy. Because I understand now the weight of it. I understand much better why Jesus went to the cross for us because he had a chance to see us in person. He spent 33 and a half years on this earth and saw just how desperately wicked and deceived we are. And said, Father, let me die for you. And so each of us needs to be willing to die, as it were, for one another. And, and this death would be to set aside what I think, believe, feel, think I know, and just get right in there and just act like Jesus and represent the cause of Christ with this person and the cause of this person with Christ. Just let it flow like electricity until mercy leads them to openly confess before God what they have done which opens the door for God to extend them grace. And now, they're in an entirely different situation. Are you still with me? He goes on to say, there is a sin unto death. I do not say that he shall pray for it. He's not saying you can't. He's just saying you don't have to. A sin unto death refers to a sin that contributes to the death of one's soul, which refers to the death of one's relationship with the life that is Christ Jesus. And the primary category of sins that contribute unto death is the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. I can't say that there are not others because I don't know them. But I'm certain about the issue of blasphemy. So what is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit and how does one commit blasphemy against the Spirit of God? 
Blasphemy is an extreme form of irreverence or an extreme insult leveled against God. It is sacrilege with the intent of dishonoring God. Notice now, the intent was to dishonor God. You see, sometimes people do things and they don't have an intent to dishonor God. You get the kids using the OMG. Oh my God. And they don't know it. They're essentially using his name, even though that's not his given name, as he has shared, but they're essentially using his name in vain, but not with the intent of dishonoring him. And then there's a curse word that I can't stand. Y'all know the one. That uses his name with the intent of dishonoring him. Okay? You see the difference? Okay? So intentionality here is... is Okay. (laughs) In the earth, God's personal and permanent representation is his spirit. And so to insult the Holy Spirit is to insult God personally. So how does one blaspheme against the Holy Spirit? I've identified three ways. There may be more. The first way I would categorize as apostasy. A-P-O-S-T-A-S-Y. Apostasy. And in this case... I'll define apostasy as attributing the works of the Holy Spirit to oneself or another entity. In other words, the Holy Spirit heals somebody and I walked around talking about how I'm, I'm a healer. Look how, I, look how many folk I've healed. You know, look how many people I've saved. I haven't saved anybody, you know. I just led people to the place where salvation could occur in their life. But there are those who cross over the threshold and begin to believe that they can just command healing anytime, you know. That they, and to the degree that when they can't actually heal somebody, they pull stunts to make it look like they heal people. You know that we've heard about these kinds of things. Also, for another example, an agnostic is operating in a level of apostasy because an agnostic disavows any knowledge of God's existence, which is actually blaspheming the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the earth. Because how does an egg and a sperm come together and make a baby like you? You got to know that that's just not nature. That's supernature. Things that are unexplainable, inexplicable scientifically, they keep trying to find the the God, uh, the the God uh, particle. They ain't gonna find it till they get saved. <laughs> because they want to prove this Big Bang theory. Stuff was totally dead and it just spontaneously came to life. I can explain it. God breathed into the man and he became a living soul. That was the God particle. His soul. Okay? But agnostics just cannot, they just deny, you know, they just, they just can't understand it. So they just disavow any knowledge of of God's existence, which is blaspheming the ministry of the Holy Spirit. An atheist completely denies the existence of God, which is definitely blasphemous. Now, an agnostic can come to the knowledge of God and be saved. 
because he hasn't closed the door. An atheist, which I've never met a true atheist, because they believe in something. They put their faith in something, even if it's just collard greens. You know, they put their faith in something. But an atheist essentially says, I deny the very existence of the living God and therefore most likely won't ever be saved. The sin of apostasy in effect attributes all of the works of the Holy Spirit to other entities. In fact, the entire theory of evolution is a sin of apostasy because it keeps attributing the works of God to something else. Now, there are, there are aspects of it where you could say, well, that was God working and we just tracked what he did. But there are elements of that theory of evolution like stuff just came to life. You know, like stuff just evolved into something else. We've never seen any proof that it actually happened. It's a theory. That's why they keep calling it a theory. And that keeps it at a level of apostasy. And we have to be careful about that. The second form of blasphemy is deception. Deception. And deception attributes the work of evil entities to the Holy Spirit. For example, a hurricane comes through and tears up a whole town. We say that was an act of God. Uh, maybe not. Could have just been an act of weather. Or it could have been an act of some evil entity, but I've heard people say, even believers say, well, the reason why New Orleans got hit so hard is because it's such an evil city. There's, a, there's a, every evil city in America. It, every city in America is basically an evil city because it's got evil in it. You know, God is not going to work like that now because of the covenant that he's made through Christ Jesus. The new covenant is not just a new covenant. It's a Christ covenant and all power is in the hands of Jesus and has been reserved for a time when the wrath of God is going to be released. But we live in a dispensation called grace. And so God is not operating like that, like he did in the Old Testament with Sodom and Gomorrah. He's not doing that now. And if we read the scriptures carefully, we can understand that the ministry of the Holy Spirit has been different in the earth between the Old Testament and the New Testament because of what happened in between the two, the two periods, which was the coming of Jesus Christ. His death, burial, resurrection, and ascension changed the way God deals with the earth until the church is raptured out. All the believers lived in New Orleans too. Why would God punish them? You know what I'm saying? He didn't punish Lot like that, you know, or even with Solomon and Gomorrah. So we have to think before we speak and attribute something to the Holy Spirit that would not be him. That's not apostasy. That's simply being deceived. The enemy wants us to attribute to God those terrible things that occur because he wants man to hate God. He wants man to hate God. He wanted Job to hate God. Job wouldn't do it. John is not either. Hope you won't. There is a third blasphemous area which is the area of suicide. It is blasphemous in that it is a sin against one's own body which was purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And it is a terminal act eliminating any opportunity for repentance. So if a believer commits suicide, 
that is a blasphemous act, just as much as it is if a, a non-believer does. Suicide is a gross failure to acknowledge both the power and the authority of the Holy Spirit to fix whatever it was. Whatever would lead me to want to take my own life, I'm saying that's too big an issue for the Holy Spirit to handle. Therefore, I got to sin against my own body, which is not something that we're able to do because our body is a temple of God. We are not allowed to destroy the temple. Are you with me? Now, all sins under death are eventually rewarded with permanent separation from God. In the Old Testament, they were often, that was an immediate separation from God. You know, you would think about um, Nadab and, and Abihu, you know, they went out there and just going to light the stuff up with strange fire, and they just dropped dead. And Moses told Aaron, don't you dare shed a tear. And Aaron was like... That's how my mom used to do me. Stop that crying, boy. She would get that. She would whoop me good. Hush that fuss. <laughs> Fix your face. I'm about to blow up. <laughs> Let me go somewhere. Let me go somewhere, you know. But she would put me on lockdown. That's the way Moses did Aaron. And Aaron just shut up <laughs> and let it happen. You know, because... When God drops somebody, you know they're not coming back, and you don't want to go with them. But the thing is, because God doesn't punish us immediately, doesn't mean that there's going to, the penalty is going to be lessened. And preserving the penalty might actually increase the penalty in both its effect and its impact. In other words, we shouldn't play with God. Now, verse 17 says, all unrighteousness is sin. And there is a sin not unto death. You see, God realizes that we are still in this earth. And we are still faced continually, I would say bombarded continually, with the temptation to venture over into areas where the Holy Spirit would not lead us. But the vast majority of sins are immediately eligible for God's forgiveness and for our cleansing. Such sins can be confessed and forgiven simply because a believer asks. There is no other faith or religion that offers such assurance. You see, if, even if a person commits a sin unto death we are not prohibited from praying for them we are just not required to step into that gap you follow me but if we choose to try to step in there and bring that linkage and the person fails to personally confess because you know that linkage to provide mercy it's supposed to give them an opportunity to confess and repent so that grace can again flow between God and them. If they fail to do that, then they still are going to pay the price for what they did. That's why suicide is such a problem, because they'll never get to confess what they did. Okay? You follow me? I'm not looking down on anyone who has ever taken their own life it is a terrible tragedy whenever it happens and it impacts a lot of people going forward. I'm not judging anyone. I'm simply saying that's a serious problem because you can never get the grace. You can, even if somebody steps in and tries to pray for the mercy, the person can never personally confess it and get the grace and the Bible says, for we are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. You got to have grace to be saved. I'm just saying what the Word says. But when 
sins can be confessed and repented. The Bible said, told us in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9 that if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He said if you confess it. Didn't even say if you, you have to get the full understanding of it and repent yet. Just confess it. Just don't let it linger and you, and you and God can't talk about it. Bring it up. Don't make God have to come and find you with it, you know. Like like if I, I was telling my wife, if I was a police officer, you know, and somebody run for me, shoot, I ain't going to be doing all that running and I got a gun, you know. I mean, you know, so, if, you know, if you make me run after you, that's going to be bad. Because, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, I see them run and they run and run and run and run and run. Like, my God, I would have been stopped running a long time ago. Either they got away or they got shot. But this is an important aspect of Christianity because no other faith or religion offers an assurance that God will forgive and cleanse. And I'll tell you why it's so important. Because if heaven is perfect, the first time somebody imperfect steps in, Heaven is no longer perfect. So there has to be some cleansing so that we can take on the righteousness of Jesus because he's not going to put his righteousness on dirt. And so God's forgiveness and the reestablishing of the relationship, our relationship with God, that we might be cleansed with the blood of Jesus it's critically important. You see, there's an assumption that sin corrupts man to the degree that he not only is not perfect, but also that he cannot perfect himself. When they said man fell, Adam fell, he fell and couldn't get up. However, at the direction of the will of God, God the Father, that is, God the Word, Jesus Christ, reduced himself to put on human flesh and entered into direct kinship with man so as to be able to redeem man in accordance with the law of God. You see, you had to be kin to somebody to redeem them. You had to be kin to somebody to be able to go in and say, well, look, let me, let me pay for him. Let me redeem him. I, I'll pay what's required. And such redemption provides man with all of the opportunities that were spoken of in the parable of the prodigal son. In your own private time, you can reread the parable of the prodigal son, which is immensely important to our understanding of the gospel of how we're saved. Because when the son came to himself, huh, he looked around and said, I'm living in a pig pen, feeding swine that I'm not even supposed to touch. And I'm down here living with them and looking at their food, go, lick at my lips. Let me go back to my father's house and ask him if I could just be a servant in his house because the servants in his house get something to eat. They have a place to stay. Little did he know that his father had been out there waiting for him, peeping every day on the road. Let me just see him coming. And when he saw him, Say, look, some a ways off, meaning that he had looked a good distance and recognized that's my son. How could you recognize the boy been living in a pig pen, lost weight, looking haggard, his countenance is all down, 
But he still said, that's my son. And he ran, the Bible says, and fell on his neck. <laughs> Began to kiss him and welcome him back. And the son had his little speech prepared. Uh, Daddy, you know, I just want to come back and say I did wrong. And I just want to come back as a servant. Father said, I don't want him none of that. Save that. The Bible says that the father ordered this, his servants to put a robe on his son and a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. In so doing, the father both redeemed his son from the corruption of his fall and restored his position as a son. see God the word Jesus Christ entered the world in the form of a servant stay with me now and in the likeness of man so as the servant that the father said put a robe on him and a ring on him and some shoes on him Jesus Christ the servant gave believing man the robe of his righteousness if you believe upon his name, he wraps the robe of his righteousness around you. So now the enemy can't even recognize you as the same one he beat up and reduced and kicked around. Because the robe covers up all of the bruises and the scars and every, every bit of what would make him think that he got the victory because all he can see is the robe of righteousness on you. He cannot understand why God would do it, but he knows he can't deny it because God did it. Ah, I've got on this robe of righteousness uh, because I believe upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, I don't just believe in him like he existed as a historical figure, but I believe on him because he's my rock my foundation my hiding place he's everything to me he's my lot my portion hmm. the robe would have been enough for me get me out of this mess cover me up so folk don't know I've been sleeping with the swine Cover me up so folk can't count my ribs and know I haven't eaten in a while because I couldn't even eat what they ate. Cover me up so folk won't be able to see all the stuff I've been through. That would have been good enough for me, but the servant, God the word, Jesus Christ, also gave man, the believing man, the authority that the signet ring would convey to speak as a member of the household of faith. You see, whenever there were some documents that my father wanted signed, I could use the ring and that's my father's name right there. I'm a part of the family. Nobody wore the ring but the family. You see, the only family members can use the name of Jesus properly. Only family members can use the name of Jesus and demons must flee. Only family members can use the name of Jesus with any expectation that the sick will be made whole and even the dead will rise. Only family members can use the name of Jesus to cast away all situations, even the authority that said, peace, be still. Stop that mess time to bring some order to this situation family members have that authority to use the name of Jesus he said that if you would come to the father and ask anything in my name never doubting you have it. 
He went on to say that if two or three, <laughs> don't take a whole bunch of folk now to change a big situation, give me two or three, by the word of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Now, whatsoever we ask for in his name, only is God going to do it, but he said, call on my name like that, I'm going to be in the midst of you. I'm coming down like I did at Babel to see what they was doing. Because that kind of agreement is impressive to me. I want to see it for myself. Up close. Having that kind of authority, Jesus himself said, that whatsoever we bind on earth or loose on earth shall be bound in heaven or loosed in heaven. That's authority. That's authority. That's the ring. The robe and the ring would have been good enough. But he said to the servant, put some shoes on his feet. You see, shoes back in those days, you'd go to the gate of the city where business was conducted. They didn't have a city hall. You went to the gates of the city where the elders would sit around. And you say, well, there's a piece of land over there I want to buy from you. How much you want for it? I want this amount. He said, well, here's my shoe. Hold that. I'll be back with your money. Done deal. Okay? So by having some shoes on a believer's feet, it allows him to conduct business all the way at the gates of hell. Wait a minute now. Folk are already destined to be in hell, but I could be down there passing out shoes and win his souls. Come on out of there. Come on out of there. You don't have to go there. Come on out of there. You see, the preparation of the gospel of peace. You see, the empowerment of being able to do spiritual business as a spiritual being means that Satan can never have your family members on lockdown. Huh? <laughs> you can go all the way to the gates of hell and say, uh, uh, he's not coming past here because I got a shoe. <laughs> I got a shoe to keep that from happening. And you know, I'm going to hold this spot right here until he can get with Jesus and work it out. The servant God the Word, Jesus Christ, did all of that for us. The prodigal son's father further restored his son's identity as a son by preparing a feast in his honor. God the Father restores a believer's identity by placing his spirit, his own spirit, within the believer to cleanse and restore the temple. All of us dirtied up our temple. All of us have sinned and done some stuff, you know. I mean, if there was a video of most of our lives, we'd be trying to buy every copy of it, you know, so it couldn't be seen. But the Holy see all that guilt and condemnation walking around inside of us would drive us insane. But the Holy Spirit comes in, let me scrub a dub dub over here and let me wax this part over here. Gonna need a little bit more blood over here, you know, and cleans us up and gives us some kind of identity that allows us to feel significant again because the value that God has placed on us says that we are priceless and the only thing else in the, in, in, in the universe that's priceless is the blood of Jesus. And so when the blood of Jesus is waxed on us, we become priceless and now the devil can't afford us and so we can't go to hell because he can't make the payments so 
So why a man cannot perfect himself, he can't be perfected by a perfect man. And there's only one, Jesus. Therefore, sin is not the victory it was presented as being. Even the wages of sin, which is death, lost its sting because it can be refused when one gives his life to Jesus. Yeah, you can get this dirt, this dust right here, you know, but you can't get the rest of me. I'm going to be with Jesus. You know, I'm going to be with Jesus. Now, verse 18 says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not. But he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. People get confused about this sin of not, because we know that we all sin. However, we don't all sin continuously and without consideration for what we're doing. You see, sinners sin unconsciously, in that they don't even give any thought to the consequences of their sin nor do they consider the impact that their sin has upon their relationship with God. They just sin unconsciously. When believers sin and confess their sins, which often leads to true repentance and full restoration of their relationship with God, it means that their sin was conscience. Lord, I've sinned, but I still hear you calling my name. Lord, I've done wrong, but I still hear you calling my name. I'm trying to tell you now that when believers sin and they confess their sins, God is not going to let them keep be too comfortable with their sins. Eventually, they're going to come out of their sins. You know? But you got to stay on the confession wagon. Don't ever think, think well, my sin is so great, I, I just can't talk to God about it. You need to talk to God, but not too many other people. Because God will throw your sin into the sea of forgetfulness. People don't have one of those. They might not bring it up, but they get that look. And it's like you it's like you have, uh, what is it, te telepathy or whatever, where you can just know what they're thinking, you know? So you might not want to confess your sins to Lottie Dottie or everybody. But talk to Jesus about it. He'll handle it. He's sitting right beside God the Father. And it says, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. The begotten of God is God's only begotten son. He keepeth himself. Satan don't have nothing on him. And so because he is our kinsman and because he recognizes that our frailties he understands that temptation cannot be prevented, not under the current status. But we are not slaves to sin anymore. Remember when we used to have to go to the club? You'd be so tired you couldn't hardly keep your eyes open, but you had to show up because it was Friday. Worked all day. You can't go till late because nobody went to the club at 9 o'clock unless you just want to get some potato chips or something, you know. But see, we're not slaves to sin anymore, so temptation can be overcome. Notice I didn't say that you won't ever fall for it. I said it could be overcome. And temptation cannot be temptation if it does not tempt us to the utmost. Mild temptation is only a nuisance. But real temptation presents us with a true struggle. 
You see, I, I, I went to Las Vegas. I could sit around and watch people gamble all day. I ain't had no money to gamble. So it wasn't a temptation. I mean, it might have been nice. You know, you think maybe I can win a couple of dollars, but you know, no. Maybe I can lose more than that. That's not a temptation. And there are things that, you know, well, I wouldn't mind doing that, but I don't really need to. But there are temptations that are present major struggles for us. Some of us are tempted by the need to be acknowledged. Pride is a major temptation. Give me my respect. Possessiveness is a major temptation. That's mine. Gluttony. A plate full of fried chicken is a problem that needs to be solved. So you're either going to eat a lot or you better pray a lot if you love fried chicken. And Paul wrote about these kinds of struggles in Romans chapter 7, you can look at it on your own time about how the thing that I want to do for God, <laughs> can't seem to find a way to do it. But the thing that I say I don't want to do, that's the thing I wind up doing all the time. He said, oh wretched man am I. Say it again. Who shall deliver me from the body of this day? Ain't but one that can do it. Jesus. Can't perfect myself. Can't perfect myself. This is why it says he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers, number one, utmost, for the perfecting of the saints. Because Jesus himself wants to perfect us through his chosen vessels. But the good news out of all of this is that Satan cannot possess a believer. So you can stop looking at your horror movies like you could be in trouble. I don't even watch them anymore because they don't scare me no more. Because I'm saved. I remember when I used to watch them and oh my goodness. Remember when I saw the exorcist for the first time. Well, I was like, whoa. You know, when they get the priest. But then I don't think, but wait a minute, the priest was drinking and smoking. <laughs> you know, so, so I don't know what his situation was. He already said he didn't have much faith, you know. But we who are believers cannot be possessed by sin. Do you hear me? Because we belong to Jesus and we are not for sale. Verse 19 says that we know that we are of God and the whole world lieth in wickedness. We're separated from the world and under God through Christ Jesus. Therefore, Jesus is the door through which we pass from darkness into light, from death unto life, and from hopelessness unto an eternal hope. As the door, Jesus represents a barrier between Satan and us. However, he does not represent a barrier between us and Satan. In other words, we are continually free to step back into darkness. We are continually free to step back into death, and we are continually free to step back into hopelessness at any time. Jesus will not prevent us from sinning. Instead, he prevents sinning from usurping authority over us. Sin can't just come and make me do anything. But if I want to sin, Jesus won't stop me. The year of Jubilee in the Old Testament represented an opportunity for a kinsman to purchase one of his relatives out of bondage. But the person could always turn right around and sell himself back into bondage. The scriptures say like a dog returning to his own vomit. Verse 20, and we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding 
that we may know him that is true and we are in him that is true even in his son Jesus Christ this is the true God and eternal life I love the way he closes out little children keep yourself from idols amen <laughs>